Hello, everyone. Figured I'd just give a little rundown while we're waiting for everybody to uh, join in this morning. My name is Shannon Fitzpatrick. Excited to be here this morning. You can find me at the Pleasant Hill store. Um, please come by. I know you have lots of slope choices, but we would love to have you visit us over in Pleasant Hill. Um, welcome today to Gardening for the Birds. We are extremely lucky to have Dan Alexander back. He, um, I was thinking that I've done numerous um, webinars now where Dan is the expert on numerous different topics, I guess making him kind of a jack of all trades. Um, I'm excited to find out exactly what it is that Dan is not an expert on. I'm certain that, uh, that there's a couple things, but certainly not as it pertains to gardening and, and being in the nursery. So we're super excited to have him here today. Um, if you don't have your outline, you can find it in the email that was the, um, sent to you, or you can find it on the website. If you go to slopegardens.com, it's under the what's happening tab under webinars. You should be able to find the outline for the day. I'll give you a minute to find that. And in the meantime, we'll talk about what's coming up. Uh, obviously this week, Dan is talking about gardening for the birds. Um, next week, we're talking about getting to know native plants. That's a huge one in the Bay Area. Lots of people come into the nursery asking questions about what is native. Um, we're gonna have an expert, Joan Pont of the California Native Plant Society. She'll be answering questions and giving lots of information uh, for everybody that's interested in native gardening, which is really cool. That's um, next Saturday also at 10. And then the following um, week, we've got Secret Season Edible Gardening with Pam Pierce. Um, she's gonna be talking about um, the secret season of, of gardening, which I guess is the, uh, the winter months and how many options there are for, for gardening also during that time of the year where everybody thinks everything is dormant and there's no possibilities, but she's going to uh, clear all that up for us and give us some possibilities. Um, and then December 4th, we've got Talanzias with Taylor. So that should be really exciting. Um, really excited to have him there talking about um, all Talanzia possibilities and how to take care of air plants. So that's exciting. There's lots of cool stuff coming up. You guys make sure that you tune in where you can. Um, in terms of today's webinar, there's going to be, um, it'll be available online on Tuesday morning. You'll be able to find it there so you can download it at that time. Um, also subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's lots of cool stuff there and um, it's the best way to keep in touch with what we've got listed. So by all means, check us out there. All right, with further ado, I would like to introduce Dan Alexander. He is here from our Mill Valley store on Miller Avenue. I'm excited to hear about birds today. I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with birds. I think I love them and they hate me. And um, we'll just leave it at that, but I'm excited to learn how to better welcome them into my space. All right, Dan, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, and uh, thanks for the setup. It, it allows me to say, uh, first of all, that I'm, I'm hardly an expert in anything. You're so loud. Oh, Shannon, you have to mute. I literally did that. On <laughs> Our technical expertise is showing. Uh, anyway, I, I, I'm hardly an expert in anything, but I know uh, uh, a little bit about a lot of things. And uh, uh, in terms of birds, it's a birding is a bit of a passion for me. Uh, and I travel around uh, looking for birds uh, and generally take a couple of trips to the Central Valley each year, and spend a couple of days out there looking at all the ducks and geese and migrating fowl uh, and uh, have observed a lot of birds uh, in my garden, which is in uh, Fairfax in Marin County. And I'm fortunate enough to be on the edge of the oak woodland there and the oak woodland, again, I'm fortunate enough that it has encroached uh, on the property and none of the people before we were there removed the wonderful oak 
trees and other shrubbery that was there. So we have a bit of a start on what would have been uh, a native uh, wild area. Uh, the area was cleared uh, below us uh, out to Sir Francis Drake Boulevard and was used for vineyards in the early part of the 1900s. Um, so uh, there's no sign of the vineyards left, but uh, the woodland is, is creeping back. Um, gar gardening is um, uh, a lot of choices. Uh, and uh, if, if you look back at when gardening as opposed to farming kind of began, it was uh, an adventure by very wealthy people, kings and noble people who made decorative gardens around their castles or you know whatever they lived in and they were usually fanciful and maybe geometric and uh, uh, had a, a, an aesthetic that was designed to take it out of nature and uh, make it something just to please the, the human eye in some way. And then in Victorian times with the rise of the middle class and people having smaller plots of ground and not needing necessarily to grow their own food, uh, we started having an aesthetic that was more like creating a painting, I suppose you might say. Uh, people wanted their plants to make a design that was pleasing to them, it was a little more naturalistic, um, but they had no sense that it really meshed with nature at all. It was simply, again, something to please a, a particular aesthetic of the human eye. Uh, more modern trends have been to include ecology as part of uh, landscape design. And that means designing so that it fits in with the local natural setting. It also is of some usefulness to the uh, animals, insects, birds that live in the area. Um, we have to keep in mind that the, the birds who live here with a few exceptions, uh, I'm thinking European starlings and, and house finches, uh, not house finches, house sparrows, uh, most of the birds we see are native birds, uh, and they're either resident birds or they're migrating through. And they co-evolved with the resident plants and the resident uh, insects. Uh, and really, uh, it's only in the last hundred years that the vast array of introduced plants have taken over our gardens and the birds have had to either adapt or go find the native foods that they're really designed to eat. So I am going to advocate here today for uh, native plants. And I hope you'll come back next week and listen to Joan who knows more than I do about native plants. Uh, but uh, for our birds, native plants are definitely the best solution for attracting them, for feeding them, uh, and for getting them nesting materials, uh, nesting sites, protection from predators. Um, all these things uh, have happened over millions of years uh, with the native plants and it have not happened but a short time with the non-native plants. Now, that doesn't mean there's no place for non-native plants, and it would be foolish for me to suggest to most people that they go exclusively with natives. Uh, that's not going to happen. Um, but you can certainly integrate native plants into your garden and uh, have an appreciation of how the native plants interact with the native birds. Uh, 
there are some wonderful resources um, that one can dive into if one is interested. And since I would say probably 80 to 90% of the Bay Area was once Oak Woodland or Oak Savanna, uh, a wonderful place to start is uh, if you look at the resources at the end of my outline, um, Kate Marin Ch uh, Marion Child's Secrets of the Oak Woodlands. And uh, one of the things that you might see in there uh, it gives just an example of interactions that we don't always think about. Uh, one of them is the importance of poison oak, um, which most of us have eradicated completely from our gardens. Although I admit I have saved a patch of poison oak in a place where nobody's going to be walking uh, in the hopes that uh, it will flower and make berries. Uh, they make a, a very pretty little white berry uh, that many birds eat during the winter. Uh, and it is a critical component of the oak woodland. Um, another one that's a little bit of a surprise is mistletoe. Uh, mistletoe grows in the oak trees mainly. And we, we know that it's a parasite, but it's not a harmful parasite. Uh, studies have shown that in forests where the mistletoe is removed, the trees don't grow as well as in forests where the mistletoe is left. And that may be because the birds eat the berries of the mistletoe during the winter and they poop around the trees and fertilize the trees. And if there's no mistletoe, they don't do that as much. Uh, Western bluebirds, which uh, are a delightful bird that you don't see so much in suburban gardens, but you see on the edge of the woodland, uh, rely completely on mistletoe berries for the winter. If there are no mistletoe, uh, there will be no bluebirds during the winter in that area. Uh, so there are the interactions between the birds and the plants that are not obvious to us unless we kind of dive into them and, and want to know about them. Uh, the books that I reference here by uh, Douglas Tallamy uh, are wonderful reading. He's, he's a good writer, number one. Uh, he's an entomologist. He studies insects uh, in, the, in the eastern United States and he lives there. So his books are a little bit Eastern centric, uh, but the lessons are universal and he does a wonderful job of explaining how the food, food web works and how the insects and the trees and the bushes and the birds all interact. Uh, and I recommend him highly. I think we tried to arrange to have him do a webinar, but I don't think we set it up yet. Right? Not yet. No. <laughs> uh, we're working on it. Working on it. Uh, that would be wonderful. Uh -huh. um, I'm, I'm. Uh, well, let's let's talk a little bit about the birds. Um, we have resident birds here in the Bay Area, not hundreds, but uh, maybe 25, 30 species that uh, of songbirds that are obvious. Um, many raptors; those are the hawks and the owls. Um, but the songbirds are what we're mainly attracting to the garden. And um, of those, we have fruit eaters, we have seed eaters, uh, we have seed eaters who eat up in the plants, and we have seed eaters who eat down on the ground. Uh, we have insect eaters, almost all birds eat insects at some point in their life, um, but a few birds uh, are, are exclusive uh, insect eaters. And so if we're going to provide a garden that does some good for the birds, we have to think beyond seeds. And this is one of the reasons, I suppose, I, I think there are many, but I, I'm not a fan of um, bird feeders. Um, it, bird feeders basically feed uh, seeds that are not in the bird's normal diet um, and they attract too many bird 
words together in one spot so that diseases can easily be passed. And although I'm sure we all mean to clean the feeders regularly, in my experience, that doesn't happen. And, uh, you know, once a month or once a season is not enough uh, to keep the diseases from spreading among the birds. Uh, so my approach to getting the birds to come close enough to my yard so that I can see them is to plant plants that will attract them. Uh, and that means planting plants that will attract insects, um, not just planting plants for their seeds. Um, insects are the basically the exclusive food of baby birds. Uh, and if there were no caterpillars munching our plants, there would be no baby birds, basically. So we have to adopt an aesthetic, if you will, that says it's okay for me to share some of my plants with the insects. Uh, and if I do that, I'm going to be uh, encouraging a food web that will go up the scale to the birds. And uh, uh, many, many, <laughs> we, we know this because, um, our customers come in constantly complaining that insects are eating their, their plants. And so we know that there are lots of insects out there and that they do eat the plants. And the idea is to have a balance uh, of insects, some of which eat the plants and some of which eat other insects. And then the birds don't care whether they're what we call good bugs or bad bugs. They'll eat them because they have lots of fat and protein in them. Uh, and whether they're getting them for their baby birds or whether they're taking a stop over on their migration, uh, they love a nice fat caterpillar. Uh, there's nothing better on their diet than a caterpillar. Uh, now, the plant that is the number one feeder and, and structure for the birds is the uh, California Valley Oak, uh, which grows all around the Bay Area. Um, it's the big deciduous oak that loses its leaves in the winter. And it's also the one <laughs> that hosts the oak caterpillars every few years, uh, which come down on little web strings. And uh, uh, we always get people coming in and saying, the caterpillars are eating my oak tree, what do I do? And the answer is, that's a good thing, let them eat it. Uh, the birds will eat the caterpillars and the oak trees and the, and the oak worms have been living together for longer than anyone knows and they get along just fine. Uh, the oak trees are happy to feed the caterpillars every now and then. Uh, what probably happens from an evolutionary point of view is that the uh, caterpillars feed a boom of birds. The birds poop out a lot more than they usually would. That fertilizes the oak trees for the next year, uh, and everybody's happy. And I've seen a couple of years where there were heavy infestations of the caterpillars and more than one year. Uh, it still doesn't do any long-term damage to the oak trees. Uh, number two would be the live oaks. Uh, in this area in Marin, we have uh, coast live oaks. In the over in Contra Costa County, I imagine they are interior live oaks, uh, very closely related, very similar looking, and hosts for many, many, many different types of uh, insects and birds. Uh, so if you are lucky enough to have either of those on, on a property, cherish it, take good care of it, get the arborist out to look at it, spray the live oaks for sudden oak death uh, a couple times a year, have an arborist do that, uh, and uh, you, you have a good structure there for having birds in your territory. Uh, after trees, uh, after those two big trees, uh, we have madrones, which um, 
grow in the oak woodland. And we have um, toyon, which is often a large shrub, sometimes a small tree. Uh, toyon makes these wonderful red berries. Um, it's uh, uh, a berry that is, uh, uh, or the plant is in the rose family. Uh, so you can think of these as little rose hips. In fact, uh, here are some little rose hips uh, and you can see how kind of similar they are. Um, they, uh, the birds eat them. Uh, the seeds go through their digestive tract and that probably uh, gets the seeds ready to uh, germinate. And then they uh, spread the seeds around with a little pile of fertilizer with them, so they're ready to go. And uh, the toyon and the birds are very, very happy together. Uh, toyon in the garden, toyon makes about an eight foot shrub. Uh, and uh, as long as you don't trim it too uh, vigorously, like a hedge, um, it'll make lots of berries for you and be very pretty in the garden. Pretty, pretty easy to grow. Uh, madrone is a big tree with the um, reddish, smooth bark, some people call it the, uh, I don't know, the air conditioner tree or something, because it always feels cold when you touch it. Um, I, I don't, that's what I've heard. I, I know it's true that it's cold when you touch it, but I, I've heard of it called something like air conditioner or ice, ice burn plant or something like that. Um, they uh, are in a different family, although they make a berry that looks a little bit like the toyon. It's a little bit larger than the toyon and is also eaten uh, a lot by the birds. It's a little bit more difficult to grow in the garden. Um, if you're going to try to grow uh, madrone, and I encourage you to try, um, go to your local native plant nursery and uh, talk to them about the best way to get it established in your garden. Um, I have some growing and I, again, I'm fortunate enough to have some open space near me. So I went to the open space, grabbed a few handfuls of soil from under some existing madrone trees and uh, planted that soil with my little baby madrones uh, in the shade of some toyons uh, and they're growing up quite nicely. Uh, the idea of the soil is that there are beneficial fungi that live with the roots of, of the madrone and that are necessary for it to be happy. Uh, whether that's strictly true, I don't know. Uh, but I like the idea of it. Um, now, flowers are kind of obvious uh, bird attractors, especially the, the easiest birds to attract are hummingbirds. Um, and uh, any of the sage species, the salvias, with these tube-like flowers. This this one is, what is this. Um, this is a, a salvia hybrid called Heatwave Blaze, but I think it's probably got some salvia gregi and maybe some microphylla in it, and. Uh, uh, the hummingbirds uh, love these and they bloom in the fall and into the winter, which is very nice because a lot of the other flowers are giving up about this time. And the uh, fall sages like this are just really coming into their own. Um, this is a very popular and, and common sage called hot lips with the uh, two tone flowers and the hummingbirds love these. Uh, they also go crazy for pineapple sage, which has a wonderful uh, pineapple scent to it um, and grows real vigorously and very quickly and gives you just sprays and sprays of flowers that um, the hummingbirds love. And they also will, this is uh, Penstem and Red Trumpet. Um, they love penstemon. Um, you can see the shape of the flower is really designed for a hummingbird's beak. Uh, and uh, there are native penstemon. Um, I don't have any examples here to show you, but 
Um, there, Penstemon heterophylla is a wonderful blue penstemon, easy to grow in the garden and highly recommended. Uh, the hummingbirds will love that as well. Uh, there are many, many shrubs, uh, native shrubs that can grow successfully in the garden. Um, Jen, if you want to Oh, sure. Point over there at the Ceanothus. Um, this is one of the uh, larger Ceanothus. Um, let's see, what did I pull here? Um, this Raven. is Ray Martin, which gets very large, um, 15 feet easily, uh, and has wonderful blue flowers uh, in the early, early spring. Uh, this is an example of a more ground cover type Ceanothus. This is uh, what's called Carmel Creeper. Um, and uh, it has the same wonderful blue flowers, but grows lower. Uh, even old patches won't be more than about three feet tall. Uh, and they can be kept lower than that. Um, they grow very vigorously uh, in a spot that they like. And those spots for this particular, for the Carmel creeper tend to be where there's some moderation of the temperature by uh, so close to the bay or in between the bay and the ocean. In the East Bay, I would look for Ceanothus gloriosus, um, which has a little different leaf. It's a little thicker. It doesn't lose moisture as quickly. But again, it has uh, wonderful flowers that um, the insects especially love, uh, and then it exceeds that the birds will eat as well. Um, so now, uh, uh, another part of this maybe perspective on gardening aesthetic is that if you want the birds to eat things, you have to leave some things for them to eat. And while we recommend deadheading the old flowers to keep things blooming, at some point you have to stop the deadheading and let the plant make seeds. Uh, and that creates a different look in the garden, which uh, I hope people can you know, learn to become comfortable with. Um, for instance, um, this is an echinacea. Uh, which had gorgeous yellow flowers. Here's the one that's fading here. Uh, and then uh, it's been allowed to make some seed heads. And these seed heads, if I kind of pull one apart here, uh, have all these tiny little seeds in the seed head. And uh, one of these days, I'm going to go out in the nursery yard if nobody has purchased this and if none of our staff has cut it back and see uh, probably uh, a chestnut, chestnut back chickadee sitting on this and eating the seeds right mm -hmm. off of the plant. Um, if we cut these off and throw them away, there are no seeds for the birds at all. Uh, and no chance that it, it, this one probably would not reseed itself in the garden, um, but the, the native equivalents uh, very well might, which we would desire maybe. Uh, and if we don't allow them to go to seed, then we're never going to have them growing up from seed. And I can tell you from much experience that a plant in your garden that starts from seed is going to be much, much more drought tolerant and stronger than any plant that you can plant that was grown in a nursery can. Um, that's just a fact of life. Um, when seeds germinate, they generally send down a strong root that uh, is different in form than the fibrous roots that have to be developed to grow successfully in a can. And uh, so if uh, it's possible to get some plants started by seed, um, they will generally be quite successful and they may even produce
produce uh, more of their kind along the way. Um, now, I, I compared a few uh, rose hips over here with the, with the toyon. Now there, whoops, there are other berries that are common in the garden and, and that birds do eat. Um, here are three of them. This is um, Cartoniaster, of which there are a number of different species and varieties. Um, this is Pyracantha here in the middle. Uh, and this is Trinit ligustrum. Now, um, there's a problem with each of these. Uh, and it is that the birds do eat them. Uh, and that they do then fly around and put them out and they do grow uh, all over the place. Uh, these at various places, these are all considered invasive non-native plants. They're certainly non-native. They're not invasive everywhere. Um, but um, Legustrum, for instance, is usually purchased at a nursery like ours, and we sell them, um, as Texas privet, which is a very compact form of the ligustrum. Uh, but it flowers and makes seeds, and the birds eat them. And then they poop them out, they grow, and they don't grow as Texas privet, which is a relatively small shrub, maybe to 12 feet. Uh, they grow as the species uh, Ligustrum japonicum that the Texas privet was selected from, and they get up about 40 feet, and they make so many seeds that they are spread all over the area. And the only good news is that they do not tend to invade the wildland, uh, but they will invade everyone else's yard. Uh, and grow in all kinds of cultivated spots. Uh, so the birds are the main vector for spreading some of these uh, invasive plants. The cotoneaster, this particular cotoneaster is not invasive, the seeds don't grow, um, but there are several types of cotoneaster that are on the official hit list that we don't sell. Uh, and pyracantha, it's not a serious problem right here, um, but do check your area and see which plants are considered invasive. Uh, and if they make berries, they're gonna be eaten by the birds and spread around. And so uh, that's the main problem with these. There is research also that shows that some birds, uh, I don't think any of ours here, and, and there's more research on birds in the Eastern United States because people have been studying them longer. Um, but some evidence that non-native plants can change the color, for instance, uh, of some birds can make it more intense so that even sickly males will look like robust, healthy males and the females can't tell the difference, so they will mate with sickly males who have been chowing down oh on non-native berries. And uh, so it's kind of, kind of like junk food for the birds. They're high in carbohydrates. The birds love them, um, but they're not necessarily the best food for them. So I, I'm, I'm not suggesting people tear them out of their yards unless they're really on the uh, invasive list, um, then you should. Um, but uh, other, otherwise, it's just a matter of being thoughtful about what you're gonna buy and why you're gonna buy it. Um, you know, because uh, something like 80% of invasive plants were brought in by the horticultural industry as ornamental plants from other parts of the world uh, because they're pretty. Uh, and nobody, nobody would argue that the uh, fields of yellow broom when they're blo blooming aren't pretty in a sense uh, until you realize how invasive they are 
and it kind of by this time for me the the yellowness has worn out and uh when i see them i my gag rate reflex so it's me uh i thought i heard that cotoneaster is like it has an intoxication like the birds get intoxicated many many of the berries when they're late in the season start to ferment and uh the birds can get uh intoxicated on them uh robins are kind of famous for that they love pyracantha and pyracantha uh, ferment easily uh and so if you get a big flock of robins flying through and eating the pyracantha then they may be flying into more windows. Uh, uh, cedar wax wings also are, are berry eaters and they're pretty well known for uh, getting drunk and flying funny. Uh, so yeah, it, it's true. Um, now, uh, rose hips can be a very uh, decorative element in the garden and they're, they're good food for the birds, even though most of the roses uh, aren't natives. There are native roses, uh, Rosa Californica, um, but um, most people do ornamental roses, and um, am among those, you can you can grow Rosa rugosa, uh, which is actually a species rose. Uh, it comes in pink and white, and they make these wonderful hips. Um, and the hips, uh, this is what you would, the hips are what you would make rose hip tea out of. It has kind of a tart flavor uh, and kind of a rosy fragrance. And inside the hips are all the seeds. And uh, some of the birds will eat the fruit, and some will eat the seeds. Um, among the fruit eaters, uh, we see over here in Miranda, at least, we see a lot of bullock orioles. Uh, and uh, they'll eat a wide variety of fruit. And um, also the uh, thrushes eat fruit. And uh, they'll eat the roses, they'll eat the berries. And uh, I, I once had an apartment that had a window that looked out on a very big persimmon tree. And when the persimmons were getting bright uh, about this time of year, maybe another month, um, the buried thrushes would come through and eat the persimmons um, in quantity. Uh, and, I, and probably they were not ripe enough for the humans to enjoy yet. They probably had a lot of alum in them, um, but uh, birds love them. Uh, now, another class of flowers, we talked a little bit about salvias and other tube-like flowers, but another class of flowers that's very good for birds and for insects, cultivating insects, are uh, compositae, the, the family of the sunflowers, uh, which all have this kind of basic design of some ray petals that come out around the edge of the flowers, and then although you can't see it with, without magnification, there are actually hundreds and hundreds of complete little flowers in here. And each one of those has to get pollinated by an insect, uh, and then it will produce a seed. And at the end of the season, uh, the seeds will be eaten by birds. And over here, we've got several more examples of composite flowers. Um, uh, this is a Shasta daisy uh, and the Coreopsis. Uh, but any of the daisy-like flowers are going to be good for your insect garden and good for your bird garden. Um, Berberus is a shrub that's kind of thorny. Uh, and deciduous, it will lose its leaves in the winter. It makes a good little kind of hedge plant or border plant. Um, it makes really good cover for the birds uh, and it'll make uh, flowers and fruit. 
uh, as well. If you can ever find uh, Nevin's Berberus, Berberus nevinii, um, it is probably the number one bird attracting plant in the shrub form that you can put in your garden. If you're not able to move a giant valley oak into your yard, try to find a Nevin's Berberus. Um, uh, we, we've looked at Ceanothus um, down here on the floor is a ground cover manzanita. Um, manzanitas are native all over our area and they have a little pink bell-shaped flower uh, early in the spring and then a berry that follows that and all aspects of it are absolutely marvelous for your garden. Um, native bees love the flowers. Um, the hummingbirds will feed on the flowers. Um, there are numerous insects that will get into the leaves of manzanita and chew on them uh, and um, make caterpillars. Um, and then the berries can be eaten by the birds as well. And uh, there are more varieties than you can possibly keep in your head, but they go from, from ground covers like the one that we just showed you to pretty good sized shrubs um, that make very pretty additions to the garden. They have reddish bark like, a, um, like the madrone and, and they're related to the madrone. Um, and uh, uh, some of the native bees, not all of them, that pollinate them um, do what we call buzz pollinating, where they glom onto the flower, they detach their rear wings, and they flap their front wings uh, at uh, middle C. I kid you not. Oh my gosh. And this shakes the pollen loose and fertilizes the flower. Uh, and then they drink some nectar as a, as a reward. Um, so they, they're pretty amazing little plants. Uh, the, in the Sierras, the ground cover manzanitas are called barberry uh, or bearberry uh, because the bears, uh, the black bears that we have left in California, uh, the brown bears were extirpated, but uh, the black bears eat mostly fruit and berries and insects. Um, if they happen to come across something that's died, they'll eat it. Um, but they're not really um, predators in the sense of chasing down smaller animals. Uh, so they eat tons and tons of manzanita berries before they go to hibernate for the winter. And uh, you can create a... Uh, a fairly uh, thick carpet of manzanita in your garden. Um, it's a little difficult if you're open to deer because the deer will browse on them as well. And sometimes it's hard to get them started unless you're protecting them from the deer. Uh, there are um, ground cover ceanothus too, which and some of which are pretty deer resistant. And so that's a, another alternative. Um, <clears throat> Another example of letting something go to seed, um, this, this is an anise hyssop, which has very green leaves uh, at the beginning of the season. It has a beautiful purple flower, bluish purple flower. And then uh, the flowers are finished and this is the seed pod. And I don't know if any of the seeds are mature enough to get out yet. It looks like not. Um, but Oh, there's some. They're sort of dropping out onto my hand. It's, it's a little difficult to see. They're very small. Uh, they're very similar to salvia seeds uh, and, and they're closely related. They're both in the mint family. Um, and uh, uh, when your anis hyssop or any of the agastoshes have finished kind of growing for the season, then, you know, leave the seed pods on. And again, uh, especially the little seed eaters like the chickadees and the goldfinches um, will come along and, and 
they're light enough that they can actually perch on a stem like this and eat the seeds right out of the seed head. It's kind of fun to watch. Uh, now, over here in the vase, um, we have some uh, what we call Mexican sage, Salvia lucantha. Um, and uh, it also has a, an interesting white variety. Uh, which the birds like just as well. Um, there's no magic to the color of flowers. Um, the colors that we see are quite different than the colors that birds see. They see uh, a lot of the spectrum that we cannot see. And so, although we may think that it's a red color that attracts a hummingbird, that's really not the case. Um, it's uh, something in the ultraviolet spectrum that they're uh, seeing uh, that the plant is giving off and that we have no idea is, is, is there. Um, and that's why you don't need to buy food coloring to put in your hummingbird food if you have a hummingbird feeder. Uh, clear is fine. Um, now, you might not think of it immediately, but uh, this is an Echeveria, a uh, hen and chickens, uh, and its flower is perfect for hummingbirds as well, and they love to feed on the Echeveria flowers. Um, so even if you uh, have a very urban, uh, succulenty garden on a deck, um, you can probably attract a hummingbird if you have, you know, quite a quite a stand of it, uh, one or two flowers probably isn't going to get their attention. Um, but if you have a lot of it, um, it, it probably will uh, earn more to you. Um, I was just thinking that a lot of, well, pretty much everything you pulled is pretty drought tolerant too. And you know, if you're- uh, it's, it's true. Um, yeah. Uh, none of these are real water drinkers, heavy duty water drinkers. Mm -hmm. um, now there are there are vines as well. Um, these are seed pods of a native. Um, what is it? Um, Virgin's Bower. Um, it is clematis, um, the native clematis, and it happens to be growing all over the uh, back fence of our nursery. Um, but um, these, both the seeds and the fluffy uh, stuff that's designed to float in the air with the seed attached to it will be used by the birds. A lot of, uh, a, a lot of these fuzzy things will be used by the birds to line their nests. Uh, and similarly, um, the lichens that grow on the oak trees, um, a lot of birds will use the lichens as a lining for their nest because they're nice and soft and they're pliable. Um, there was a recent edition of the uh, Native Plant Society's magazine uh, that had wonderful photos and identified the native materials that were in various bird nests. Um, and uh, almost uh, all of the nests included grassy flowers um, as part of the uh, structure of the nest and the lining of the nest. Um, grasses should be allowed to bloom and they should be allowed to stay until all of the fuzzy stuff basically has either blown away or uh, has been eaten by the birds on the stem. Um, grasses are essential to birds, both for the seeds that they produce and for the fact that many, many, many insects um, have a, a life stage that eats the grasses. Uh, many of our butterflies, uh, caterpillars eat grasses. Um, it's not just leaves, um, but it's going to be the native grasses that they eat. Uh, and 
Native grasses take a little bit of work to get going. Um, it's best usually to uh, start them in containers, get them going a little bit so that you can tell what's really there and then transplant them into the garden so that you're not mistaking them for just wheat grasses that are popping up. 90% um, or 99% even of our native grasses are bunch grasses, uh, meaning that rather than <clears throat> spreading along on little underground stems and making turf-like grass, they grow in a bunch and they send down extremely deep roots. Um, they have dug down and discovered some of them have roots down eight or nine feet. Uh, and I have read, I wasn't here at the time, believe it or not, it may look like I was here at the time, but I wasn't, uh, that when, when the Spanish came, uh, our hills were not as brown in the summer, uh, that many of the bunch grasses that grew there were green all summer because they had such deep root systems. And of course, the most of the grasses that we see now out on the hillsides are grasses that came with the livestock um, that the Spanish and then the uh, American colonists brought to California. Uh, so they're mostly annual European grasses um, that have taken over all the grasslands. Um, but uh, you can get bunch grasses growing uh, easily, and they do pretty well. Uh, once they get established, they don't need much water. Um, they have a very different kind of moundy look to them. They'll send up interesting flower stems. Um, and uh, uh, the, the one that you will see most often in, in a, you know, sort of, on average in a nursery, uh, which is not a native, uh, is uh, blue fescue, uh, Festuca glauca. Um, this is a cultivar called Elijah blue, which is very blue, but it is a bunch grass and it grows in a mound like this. And if you were to find Festuca californica or Festuca idahoensis, uh, which are both natives, um, they look very much like this, um, a little taller, maybe not quite as blue, uh, but they will establish very nicely in the garden, just as the uh, Festuca glauca does. Uh, Festuca glauca uh, probably will not provide the same benefit as a native Festuca would as far as the insect population and the birds go, um, because they didn't uh, evolve with it. Um, this big grass over here on the corner is deer grass, Willenbergia rigens, um, and it's wonderful if you have room for a big bunch of grass, um, and it'll make these nice tall flowers when you know, these come up five feet. Um, and uh, again, it will be a source of food for insects. Uh, and a source of seeds for the birds um, that you can easily provide. Um, this interesting stick uh, is a crepe myrtle branch. And crepe myrtles um, make these little seed pods after they make their bright, bright flowers. And I don't know if I can crush this with my fingers, maybe a little bit, but the seeds are inside there and yeah, can't really do it very successfully, but, but um, oh, a bird like a uh, black-headed grosbeak could make short work of that and have a, a nice meal from the seeds here. Um, and these are not, invasive, um, they're not native, um, but they don't see themselves all over the place and uh, can be a very attractive small tree uh, that can grow in almost any uh, of our microclimates around here. Um, gets up to about 15 feet and uh, has bright, bright white pink.
pink or red or even purple flowers uh, in the summer. Uh, so crepe myrtle, not a bad choice for a small tree. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about um, wildflowers because um, this is the time to get wildflowers going and wildflowers are terrific for the insects and the birds. And it just happens that I have a vast array here of wildflowers that are available probably at your local nursery. Um, this is a seed company called Botanical Interests, which makes some very nice mixes um, of seeds. Um, this is Pacific uh, Coast Seed Company, which specializes a little more in more, more native California native seeds, um, larger seeds in Bolinas, uh, is probably the premier native seed provider in the Bay Area. Uh, they have a wonderful website and uh, highly recommend you look there for um, native seeds. Um, the reason that this is the time to plant them is that most of our native seeds are, have evolved to spread their seed at the end of the summer or into the fall, and then to germinate when the rains come. Uh, and the rains fortunately have come, and it looks like we're gonna have more. And uh, so this is the time to get the seeds in the ground. It doesn't mean they'll all germinate immediately. Some of them need a period of time that in the wet and cold soil uh, before they'll they have what's called a secondary dormancy that has to be broken. And when the time comes, then they will sprout. Um, milkweed are, are a good example of that. Um, they often uh, won't sprout immediately on the, on the first rain, but they'll wait for a month or two and then they'll sprout. Uh, and they, uh, again, this is an advantage of growing things from seed. The milkweed will send down a root for quite a while before it sends up uh, the green sprout that you'll see above the ground. And so you'll have, uh, by the time the ground starts to dry out, uh, you'll have a good deep uh, root system for the milkweed and maybe have success in getting a patch of milkweed started for the uh, monarch butterflies. Um, Can you show the seed ball? Ball, I, I really like that because we just started carrying this one. Let's see. Oh, yeah. The hidden seed balls. Now, yeah. This is something uh, that we have in new this this year. Um, it's made by a company called Wild Jewels, J U L E S dot com, and um, it's it's just a wonderful little package that's easy to plant um, inside each packet. And this is, this is elegant Clarkia. Uh, Clarkia is known as, as uh, oops, oh, there goes one. Farewell, to, <laughs> farewell to spring because it blooms at the end of spring. It's kind of like the last spring wildflower and you know summer's coming when you see the Clarkia. Um, and inside here are 10 seed balls, which are, uh, clay that's been wrapped around uh, a bunch of seeds. And uh, the instructions are uh, set it on top of the soil, just like that, and leave it alone. And the only uh, exception to that is if you're worried about uh, squirrels or if you have a dog that eats everything that he can find, um, then what you do is, where did I put my spray bottle? I didn't bring a container really, but I, I, I can do it over here. Um, We're adaptable. We <laughs> yeah. So there's my seed ball, mm -hmm. and, and I just squirt it with water. And then <laughs> this is a cooking glass of water. Um, uh -oh, there oh, it is. Right, yeah. 
I found it. And then you sprinkle it with cayenne pepper. And I was doing this at home and I was getting the cayenne pepper pretty good in my eyes. But, I mean, not directly. But. So just sprinkle it liberally uh, and then set it on the soil and uh, the cayenne pepper isn't gonna hurt anything. Um, the squirrels are sensitive to cayenne and they will not eat it. The dogs are sensitive to it. Interestingly enough, birds are not sensitive to, uh, to capsaicin, which is the hot stuff in, in uh, cayenne pepper. Uh, and uh, so um, it's still possible that some clever bird could figure out their seeds in there, but I haven't had that happen to any of them that I've planted so far. Uh, I'm still waiting for them to sprout. It's only been a week or so, uh, but they're, uh, but they're just fine. And so um, a pot, you might as well make a pot of parky in here. I was wondering like, is yeah. it, would there be benefit to, um, because I'm gonna put seed out in my garden this weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, would there be benefit even just with loose seed to just sort of sprinkle cayenne pepper around? No. You know, I don't no? think so. Uh, I think it would be too spread out to make a difference. Okay. Um, you know, uh, so that's all you do with the seed balls. And it says, do not bury them. So I haven't buried them. I've just set them on top of the soil. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, make this pot a little more diverse by taking some seeds of what they call the Marin Meadow wildflower mix from Larners, um, which has in it, some lupin, tidy tips, owl's clover, baby blue eyes, um, all kinds of nice native wildflowers. Uh, and so I'm going to, this is what I would do if I were spreading it out in the garden. I would, this is a lot of seed. This is uh, an ounce, I think it's an ounce of seed. Um, and so this will probably cover 200 square feet uh, if I were sprinkling it out in, in the garden. Um, and what I do is mix it with some potting soil um, just so that I'm not throwing big handfuls of seed in one, one spot. Um, this will allow me to you know, take a little bit and cast it out uh, and uh, it'll be more uniform, maybe. And certainly I won't uh, have such concentrated areas where I put a big pile of seed at one, one time. That's a really good idea. So I'm just gonna take a little of this and mm -hmm. sprinkle it around. I just want a, a few other things to come up besides Clarky, and I'm gonna, kind of press it, I wanna press the seeds down into the soil so they make good contact. This is like small space gardening for birds. You can just small space do it gardening in a container. For birds. Exactly. <laughs> and then over here in this pot, which is kind of empty, I'm, I'm gonna put like a big handful of these seeds kind of swoosh them around a little and add them down. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna stick these pots out in the nursery yard and see what happens. Um, maybe there's a way we can follow up. Yeah, let's see, yeah, for sure. <laughs> in a month and see what, what has sprouted. Um, but, you know, this is about a 10 gallon size tub. So it doesn't take up a, a horrendous amount of room. You could use a more decorative pot, obviously, uh, than this one. Um, and this one's you know, roughly the same volume. It's got this taper to it. Um, and, and these are plenty big to you know, make a nice display of wildflowers. And if you had something even bigger or a window box shape, um, you can do that. Uh, it, there's really no reason to feel you can't grow wildflowers in even the smallest uh, space uh, in the middle of the city. Um, 
very possible and very satisfying. Um, they make a they make kind of a wild look. They're not um, uniform. They're not super tidy um, always, um, and they look. Uh, since they're from seed, there's actually some genetic diversity going on there. Un unlike uh, a flat of yellow marigolds that have been bred and bred and bred and bred to the point where they're just about identical, even if they were grown from seed. Uh, here, uh, these uh, learners collect these in the wild uh, very carefully so that they don't overdo it. And they don't always have the same seeds each year, depending on what has been blooming adequately that they feel they can harvest them. Um, uh, and so I highly recommend you at least look at their website, longerseeds.com. Uh, on my outline, you'll see a couple of books by Judith, Judith uh, Larner. Um, and they, uh, she was one of the original um, restoration gardeners in the area who consulted with people and helped them to restore their gardens to a more native form. And since she's branched out and become more interested in Native American cuisine, if you will, uh, and what Native Americans ate here, and how they cultivated um, the wild spaces to uh, have more food available. And that included um, big plots of uh, manzanita on uh, Mount Tamalpais. Uh, and there are uh, many, many, many types of wildflower seeds were harvested and eaten uh, seasonally. Uh, in addition, obviously, to acorns. Uh, Dan, how often, because I'm sure somebody's going to ask, how often would you water? Well, this? I'm going to, oh, I, I brought a watering can yeah. with water in it, didn't I? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to water these, and then I'm going to put them outside and uh, see what happens in terms of rainfall. Um, we're supposed to get some rain. Monday, Tuesday, so I won't have to water before then. That'll water them. Probably that will be enough water for a week. Uh, and if it doesn't rain again, then I'll look at it. If the top starts to dry out, maybe that that far down, I might give them a little sprinkle. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, these uh, these plants grew up here. And so they, uh, they adapted to the fact that we can have rain in the, in the fall and then no rain for a while uh, until you know, more of our winter rains come. Uh, and so they're smart enough to know uh, whether they should germinate or not. Also, if they do germinate, uh, they're gonna send a root down and this soil is gonna stay wet down in here for a long time uh, in the kind of weather we're having now, the coolness. Uh, so once they germinate, they're gonna be fine. And you know, if we go a month without rain, then I'm gonna have to water, um, but you're really not gonna have to water much. Uh, and these seed balls, um, you know, uh, they are, their instructions, and, and I'll admit, I, I haven't grown them before, so we'll see what happens. But the instructions are just to lay them on top of the soil. And when they get the right amount of moisture and the right amount of, and the right temperature, they'll sprout. And so I'm trusting um, that that's the case. And uh, of course, hoping that nothing eats them before that. <laughs> but uh, we, don't, we don't have too many dirt eaters around here. Um, so, um, I think probably they're going to, they're going to do fine as, but they are funny looking, uh, I, I will admit that. And, and I have them spaced along in, in the front of my front yard along the street. And, uh, they're real silly looking, especially because I've, I've put little, um, sticks with labels on them for each one. So um, I, I have a goofy looking yard. Um, I wanted to just show you also uh, 
this torch Cathonia here. Uh, Cathonia is uh, sometimes called Mexican sunflower, um, can be a uh, oh, 10, 12 foot um, annual plant. Uh, absolutely crazy sometimes with all of these wonderful orange flowers. And then uh, now I, I've been deadheading it to encourage it to flower more. And you can see what happens is that you know, I flowered here and then I cut that off and now it sent out this flower, and, but it's getting to the end of the season. And some of the flowers are finished and I haven't deadheaded them. And so again, this is a, a composite flower, same idea. It's going to have hundreds of little seeds. It's not ready yet to uh, show us its, its seeds. But in here, just like a sunflower, but much smaller, uh, are going to be hundreds of little seeds that, again, the, uh, the small seed-eating birds will be able to just sit on there and pick away at the it's like a buffet line. Take them apart. Yeah. Yep, it's the buffet. <laughs> hey Dan, can I ask a quick question that we've we I've had uh, repeated here? Yes. If you do decide to deadhead in your garden, um, yes. can you still hang on to those? Can you take whatever the seed heads are from the flowers and like, you know, put them in a bowl or put them in a platter or put them in a place where birds can still get to them? You know. I think for those of us that maybe don't want, you know, uh, spent flower heads all over the place, is there a way to still, you know, make them available without leaving them on the flower head? They have to dry them. I would like to say yes, um, but I think the answer is more of a no. Um, and here's the reason um, the seeds have to mature. Uh, if uh, when the flower first fades, you cut it off, um, the seeds are never going to mature. And so there isn't going to be anything for the birds to eat. Um, once they got to this point, you could certainly cut them off. And what I would do is cut them with some stems and maybe tie them together and just hang them uh, together. Or you could put them in a bowl, although if they sit in water, that's probably not going to be good for them. Um, but if you were to just hang them up like this, then the birds could come and perch and eat from them just fine. Uh, I've done that with sunflowers uh, at the end of the season, where you, instead of taking the seeds out of the flower head, you just cut it off, let it dry and hang it up and the birds will come and pick at it. Um, but uh, let's see, do we have a flower here that's sort of on its way out? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> The, the problem really is that, that the, the flower will not have had time when it ju has just faded um, to make the seeds. For instance, even this one, which has lost all its petals at this point and that I was trying to pick some seeds out of, these seeds have not matured yet. And so it, by picking it, um, I think the odds are that they won't be able to mature, uh, they just won't have enough moisture and energy that they can suck out of the leaves here. Uh, so I, I think that's a tough one. Um, what, what I usually do is deadhead until late summer uh, because I want more and more flowers. Uh, and then I stop deadheading in late summer and just kind of uh, let it go natural. It's a kind of a, a fall, I mean, it's a, it's, as a designer, I would say it's a fall look, right? Exactly. You know, the, the grass plumes and the, the dried seed heads and stuff like that. The so berries. The berries. The seed heads. Yeah. Um, the fall color. Mm -hmm. um, it all kind of goes together. Um, and it, it, it's a matter of getting used to it, it I, I think, um, and, and setting priorities. Um, uh, I... I have 
for instance, I have a deck where I have some window boxes that I keep pretty well manicured. I mean, they're, they're just decorations, basically. And then I have other parts of the garden, which maybe I see at a little more distance, <laughs> where I, uh, it's easy to let them go more natural. So it's, you know, uh, none of it is simple. It's all nuanced. Um, and it doesn't all have to be the same. Um, I, I think that's important. Um, <clears throat> if you ever happen to grow an artichoke, this is a young artichoke, um, and it'll get gigantic uh, four feet across and three feet tall. And it, if you uh, cut the artichoke, you're cutting the flower bud and you're eating the flower bud, basically. If you let the artichoke go and bloom, it'll make a giant blue, bluey, purpley uh, thistle flower. And then that thistle flower will make a bunch of seeds. They won't grow, they, you don't have to worry about that, but the birds will eat them and they're wonderful looking. Um, so it, this, this is, uh, thistles in general, uh, and echinacea is not really a, a thistle, but it looks a little thistly. Um, <clears throat> but thistles in general are bird paradise. Um, many, many birds will eat thistles, and thistles are one of the main insect hosts. Even this artichoke has uh, these lower leaves. Somebody has been here. I don't think you'll be able to see it, but um, you can see right through the leaf. Um, because some yeah. insect has been rasping away on it and may have provided a buffet for some passing bird. Um, and it's hard to tell what the insect was from this, but it was small. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the things that, that is hard for us to imagine is that some of these smaller insect-eating birds um, oh, a nuthatch, for instance, um, which are kind of creeping birds on, on the oak trees often is where you see them. Um, they are exclusively insect eaters. Um, they're not going to be interested in any of the seeds that we're growing here. Um, but they eat even the tiniest insects and uh, they must have incredible eyesight because Birds in general don't have a sense of smell, so they're not smelling out the insects. They're seeing them and eating them and getting them out from little crevices in the bark and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, the birds are not uh, monolithic in, in terms of how they go about surviving, and uh, we are best off to give them as many options as we can. And some of these shrubby things like the manzanita and the berberus and uh, the smaller ceanothus give cover for the birds as well. Um, I'm not a big fan of the Himalayan blackberries that have gone wild in the area, um, but they give great cover uh, for small mammals and for birds. Um, we have native blackberries that would have done the job too, but they've sort of been pushed out by the Himalayan blackberries. Um, but having a um, low shrubbery, not just herbaceous plants, you know, that, that don't have woody stems, but low growing woody plants, um, give birds, small brown birds cover, uh, from predators and, um, they host insects that the birds can eat as well. So ground cover manzanitas, um, ground cover ceanothus. Um, various kinds of, of uh, currants, uh, ribes, um, are great decorative native plants as well. Um, some of them, like uh, ribes sanguinea, has a, a beautiful red flower that droops, um, and then they make berries. Um, uh, and they're, oh, three or four different local rivies that um, we can all grow in our gardens very easily. 
Um, they're not always so easy to find. Not, not every nursery has a big native section. And, um, you know, we're fortunate here in Marin to have three really good native plant nurseries nearby. Um, but I think the East Bay has a number two East Bay natives. Um, is one that comes to mind. Um, and uh, I, I urge everybody to at least, you know, look around and talk to the people at the native plant nursery and see what might work well in your area. Worth giving a try to. Um, some of them are a little difficult to get started, um, but once they do, um, they're at home and they're gonna do just great. So uh, any other questions we have, Shannon? Yeah, just a, a couple more. Um, one of them was in terms of pruning, I think that um, we've had a couple of classes about pruning things back, you know, getting to that time of year. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the questions was, does it make sense to maybe not over prune at this point so that there's still small branches and stuff left for, uh, you know, nest building and, you know, seeing birds kind of break off some of the smaller branches. Um, does it make sense to hold off on some of the, you know, the more, the stronger pruning at this point? Uh, I, I think it does make sense to wait a little longer uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is that plants aren't really dormant yet. Um, they won't be dormant until, depending on our weather, but generally it takes till the end of December for things to really go dormant. Uh, and that's the best time to plant, uh, prune most things. Um, the second is that uh, it's not so much for nest making this time of year um, as for shelter for the migratory birds. Um, a, a tree that's a little brushier is better for them uh, and will hold more insect life, even though it doesn't look like it's doing it, it is. Um, and then, uh, Nest building usually happens in the spring. And, uh, you know, it, you want to prune as needed. Um, and I, I can't really say that I, I have thought about later on pruning for the birds specifically. Um, I mean, I think it's a, a, an, an interesting notion to leave some brushier areas if you can. Um, it's probably not going to hurt. A lot of our pruning is just for aesthetics uh, and isn't really affecting the health of the plant. Um, so if you leave some brushy dead stuff on the inside of the shrubs, um, that's probably a good thing. Um, as I think about it. And it's probably mostly going to be hidden by the foliage uh, in the springtime anyway. Right. So I think that's a neat idea. Okay. Uh, you know, you, you want to prune out broken things uh, so that you don't have jaggedy broken branches that can be attacked by fungi. Um, but if it's just small smaller dead branches that because there's not enough light inside um, I, I would leave some of that for sure okay Is it also like leaving stuff on the, like leaves and stuff on the ground like you know not necessarily cleaning like having such a sanitary garden isn't that beneficial yeah it is because many many uh, many insects live in the leaf litter uh, that would naturally collect uh, on the ground. Uh, in that first um, inch or so of what we might think of as soil is mostly just decomposed leaves and uh, worms, beetles, all kinds of things live in that layer and, and help decompose the leaves. So to the extent you can leave, safely leave some leaf litter, I mean, we. You know, we're finding a lot of different um, things here. We're, we're, we're worrying about fire, um, you know, 
uh, we we want to keep some mulch down for for drought, uh, but we don't want it to burn up in the summer. Um, it, also, we want to leave some areas that don't have a lot of leaf litter because the native bees need soil to make their holes in and, and uh, reproduce. Uh, and some birds require actual soil to find the seeds in that they're looking for. So we don't want every inch to be covered with five inches of, of you know, fur bark mulch. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, it's a matter of finding a balance. Um, right. Some areas we mulch, some areas we leave open, and uh, some things we prune because we're doing it for the way they look, some things we prune for health, and some things we can probably just let grow. Right, that makes sense. One, just to tie off of one word that you just used, which is litter, uh, one of the questions that was asked was, does it make sense to, and is there benefit to just kind of scattering normal seeds, like, I, I, you know, tossing down sunflower seeds or pumpkin seeds or something like that? Are you going to, you know, attract more rodents than you are birds? Um, does it make sense to, do, I've seen, you know, small little feeders that have, you know, just a little seed, um, you know, grouping in there, but does it make sense to kind of scatter them around on the ground? Or like I said, is that just asking for trouble? Uh, if you just scatter them widely, like a little salt on your food, um, I, I don't think it's gonna attract a lot of uh, rodents. Uh, I mean, squirrels will find them. I, I, I mean, they're a rodent, obviously, but <clears throat> not a, a pesky one in my experience. Um, I, I don't know that I would scatter seeds in an attempt to feed or attract the birds though. I mean, to, to me, that's just like a bird feeder and you're going to get birds um, congregating together that shouldn't be congregating together uh, is the short answer. Um, it's like out here in the parking lot, there's somebody who feeds the uh, crows and ravens. Well, it's wonderful for the crows and ravens as far as they're concerned, but they're all packed together where they wouldn't be. I mean, one or two of them that are good buddies might be together on a branch, but you're not gonna have 12 or 15 of them packed together unless they're having a meeting of crows. Um, but the ravens don't meet like that. Um, and so I'm just leery of anything that brings the birds in, in a concentration that isn't natural. Um, because I think that spreads disease and I would rather see fewer healthy birds than just bring them in for my pleasure and risk that they're gonna get sick as a result of that. So that's, that's my particular two cents worth. That's perfect. That's that's what we're here for. So, so thank you. <laughs> um, I, I cannot even, uh, it's hard to now kind of wrap your head around so much um, information and knowledge that we got here today from what to plant to how to care for it, all the different options. It was super informative and we really appreciate it. I was that was awesome. I hope that everybody online um, was able to follow along and that you uh, benefited from today's webinar. Dan, again, thank you so much for everything. Um, yeah. Tried to get all the questions. I'm sorry if we missed a couple, but um, by all means, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on Tuesday everything will be posted online, and you can check it out at slopegardens.com or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can watch it there after a Tuesday morning. Okay, that way you can rewind, you can go back and write down anything that you missed um, while Dan was talking today. So thank you guys all so much for being here. Again, the upcoming webinars that we have next Saturday, we've got the Getting to Know Native Plants with Joan Pont from the California Native Plant Society. That's next Saturday morning at 10. And then following that, we've got the secret season of edible gardening with Pam Pierce. 
So we're excited to uh, have her come back and talk about um, Golden Gate gardening, super important for our area. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, looking forward to seeing you soon. Take care, enjoy your weekend. Bye.